Hello world and welcome back to the Simple Sports Podcast. It is I, Capo, here with another episode for you. And today, we are going to be talking about my NFL Power Rankings. Not the full list, just the top 10. Uh, the full list will be talked about next week once we're into week four. Um, but I did want to just shuffle a few things around for the top 10. So we'll talk about the NFL Power Rankings. We will also obviously be talking about tonight's Thursday night football showdown between the Broncos and the Jets. Can't wait to watch that, says no one ever. Um, but it's still Thursday, it's still DraftKings, which means you can still make money, which means we're going to talk about it. Uh, but first, got to go back to Monday night, Ravens versus Chiefs. It was ugly, uh, a lot uglier than I thought it was going to be. I picked the Ravens to win, I picked the Chiefs to cover, turns out I had that Totally wrong. Um, Chiefs covered in one in ugly, convincing fashion over the Ravens. It was not remotely close, um, not even as close to the score indicated at the end, and even that wasn't particularly close. Um, it should have been a 30 point loss for the Ravens. Um, here's the thing there were two things that stood out to me mostly. Um, one was the obvious, right? Patrick Mahomes is just better, a lot better than Lamar Jackson. He, he just is. Uh, he can throw better. He's obviously not the runner that Lamar Jackson is, but when he does run and he chooses to run, he always makes it count. Um, and so just as a quarterback, he's better. I think we, we can all agree on that. What concerns me about Lamar Jackson is something that concerned me last year something that we saw pop up in the playoff game last year and it, it showed his ugly head again and it wasn't it's not his inability to throw or inability to make plays or anything like that there's two main concerns that i personally have with lamar jackson and one of them is that he he seems to be in his own head he always especially in these big games the chiefs the playoff game last year versus the Titans. Um, he always seems to be pressing. He always seems to be trying to trying to win the game instead of playing the game, which, I mean, that seems counterintuitive, right? Obviously, you want to win the game, but he seem, it seems as if he's trying to take the game and trying to seize it instead of playing the game and playing to what they do. And you can see it in the frustration. He, early in the game, I think they were down a touchdown. Maybe they were down two scores. I don't remember exactly when it was. He gets a run out of bounds on third down. They, they end up having a punt or something along those lines. And you see him on the sidelines. He's slamming his hand on the grass. He did the same thing against the Titans last year in the playoffs. Early on in the game, the Titans get a, a stop, um, force the Ravens to punt. He's frustrated, slamming stuff on the sideline. And I, listen, I get it. It's frustrating, right? That, you know, that's not an issue. Um, as far as him being frustrated, but you can't exude that and let the other team see it. It's the second time he did it, and it's a concern, and you can see it in his play. There were a number of plays, especially as the game went on, where the ball was snapped, and his eyes immediately went down. Now, is that a credit to the defense? Well, of course, in some levels it is, right? Um, but a lot of the sacks that he ran himself into were just that. It was sacks that he ran himself into. He has to learn how to step up into the pocket. There's a few quarterbacks that their pocket presence is just outstanding. Even as a young quarterback, Joe Burrow moves within the pocket so, so easy. Patrick Mahomes is another one, just moves around in the pocket so, so easy. Tom Brady is what he's known for. Obviously, he's not a quick or fast guy. He's not a great athlete, but he has those dancers' feet in the pocket where he can just slide and move, slide up, slide around guys, and he's, he's elusive within the pocket. Lamar Jackson is not, at least not yet. Um, they snapped the ball, and, and like I said, oftentimes his eyes were already down. He's looking to run, and you got to wonder how much of that is just the uncomfortableness that the Chiefs put him in and how much of that is him pressing, and I think a lot of it is him pressing. I think more than half of it is just him trying to be a hero, trying to win the game, and it's just it's not working. It's just not working. He's got some work to do. Missed some throws, um, you know, like normal. Now, he didn't get a ton of help from a lot of guys. Mark Andrews dropped a touchdown that could have turned some 
turn the momentum or at least stop the bleeding a little bit. Maybe they could have rallied from that. Um, he drops a touchdown. He also dropped a it looked like a seam route or deep post, something something along those lines, right down between cover two. Had him beat, had the linebackers and the safeties in trail position. Lamar Jackson drops it right in the chest or right in the hands. Maybe a touch, just a touch overthrown, but no excuse. You got to come down with that ball, especially in that game against that team. Like those are the plays that you have to have. Um, so not a lot of not a lot of help there. He's got some work to do. Um, we'll talk about where I have them in the power rankings here shortly. Um, DraftKings for the showdown. Swing and a miss in some places, and we nailed a few other pieces. Um, Sammy Watkins as a sleeper pick. Eh, I mean, it was okay. Didn't didn't produce a lot. Um, in fact, not much at all. Mark Andrews was my selection for captain's pick. Probably would have worked out if he didn't have those drops. He had a touchdown that he dropped, a pretty long one. I, want to say, I mean, it was 30, maybe 40 yards. Same thing for the deep pass I just talked about that he dropped going down the middle, cover two. Uh, dropped that one. That would have been close to 100 yards, probably around 70 ish. Uh, and then between, and then he had another drive. It was a bad throw, but he still should have caught it. One on the sidelines with Lamar Jackson running, um, throws it down the sidelines, hits his hands. Probably could have caught it. It was a tough catch, regardless. But um, so I don't necessarily think it was a bad selection. He just had a bad game. Um, so. Didn't hit on the captain's pick. However, we did have a few no plays that I think were okay. So if you, as long as you didn't play the guys that I mentioned, you probably still did okay. Clyde was hilarious. Didn't have a bad game. Just wasn't um, the threat to score that a lot of people think he is. And I think that's going to be the case for a long time. Um, he's very undersized. Unless he, I mean, unless they get it on the one and they block it well, he's not like powering through, right? Um, now, his, his production is going to come in volume, in just yardage, uh, PPR, stuff like that. Probably not going to get a lot of red zone carries. They're probably going to let Mahomes throw it, get it to Kelsey, guys like that in the end zone, in the red zone. Again, unless he's on the one, I, the production level for Edwards Hilaire is just not there um, from a DraftKings standpoint. Now, just, you know, regular fantasy, yeah, totally fine as a running back. Um, I don't see any issues there, but for DraftKings, especially for like a captain's pick, where you, you're going to need that guy to score at least once, maybe twice. Um, it's just not there for that was still there, especially with all the weapons that they have. The chances of them just feeding him the ball in the goal line probably not going to happen. So um, no issues with the must avoid there, and then also Mark Ingram. Um, part part of it was the committee backfield that he's in. Um, and then in this particular case, in this game, I mean, they're going to, against the Chiefs. And so they were out of it early. And so that means the running game is out early. And he's not he's not like an all down back or every down back, someone that's great in the passing game. He's good. Um, he can hit the screen, stuff like that, swing pass, get you a couple yards. But he's not like a Christian McCaffrey or anyone along those lines. So um, Clyde edwards Lair, Mark Ingram, must avoid, should have avoided, should have been the right call. Uh, let's get to the NFL power rankings, the top 10 that I have. And again, the full list will be out next week. May have another tweak or two to the top 10, but let's get into it. All right, so before we start with the full list of the top 10 teams, uh, a few things I want to mention right off. Um, so there were a few teams that I had ranked at the bottom of the list, the Jaguars, Washington, the Jets, um, the Chargers, the Falcons. Some of those are not going to change, but there are a few amendments. I think I'm safe to make these changes now and it not be an issue. Number 32, without doubt, is the New York Jets. They are a train wreck. Their quarterback's not very good. I started them in the year at 30, so it's not like they failed that far. Um, I actually had the Jags at 32 and Washington at 31. Washington hasn't moved, and, and quite frankly, they would be 32 if it weren't for the Jets. But the Jets are there, so Washington at 31. I got the Jets at 32. The Jags are not – you can't really move them too far up in the power rankings because they're still a bad football team, but they are far more respectable than either of those two. Um, so 
not totally sure where I would put them just yet, but um, they're not they're not 31 or 32, maybe not even 30. Um, somewhere around 28, 27, something like that. Maybe 26. I have to again once the once I get through the full list, I'll be able to more clearly lay that out. But um, certainly not the worst team in the league like I thought they were going into the season. Now, a few teams that fell out of the top 10, the Saints, I had it number three. No, no way. Um, especially without Michael Thomas. Now we'll see when Michael Thomas gets back, how they progress with him. But Drew Brees is not impressing me right now. I gave the stats last week as far as his air yards. Um, they've gotten progressively worse over the last five years, and this year is no different. Um, he is too dependent on Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara. They, you know, you can say that he's too dependent. You can also argue that that's all that he has, and no one else is any good. The film says otherwise. Um, there were there were plenty of times that Emmanuel Sanders was running open, and for whatever reason, Drew Brees didn't pull the trigger. Maybe the pressure, maybe the read, the timing is off. Who knows? Um, that's for them to determine within their own film room. But just watching it and rewatching the film, he had guys open. Um, and then Sean Payton tries to get the ball to Taysom Hill. He turns it over. Saints, I had at three. They're out of the top 10. Not exactly sure where I'll put them just yet. Um, and that's not to say they can't get back into the top 10, obviously. They certainly could. But right now, I can't I can't put them there. Um, 49ers, I had at seven. Obviously, they're not top 10 team at the moment. Too many injuries, too many key guys out. Um, so no go there. And I thought they would regress anyway. But there's a there's a valid excuse, obviously, with all the injuries. You know, you never know if they would actually be as bad as they are with those guys. In fact, I know they wouldn't be. Would they be a top 10 team? Probably in the top 10 if they were fully healthy and that all go. But without that, I can't put them in the top 10. They were at seven, no longer. Um, the Vikings, I had at eight. They may be one of the teams I put at the bottom 20 because they are terrible. Um, they had a good showing last week offensively, but it was against a bad defense in Tennessee Titans. We'll talk about them a little bit later on. Vikings at eight, no longer in the top 10. The Browns at nine, probably I would put them around 11 or 12 right now, just based on the record. They're not off to the start that I thought they would be. I think week one clouded a lot of people's judgment um, against the Ravens. And now that they've won two straight, they've kind of gone under the radar, if you ask me. I still think they're a really good team. They got a lot of issues to work out defensively, but I think offensively they found their identity. They found their rhythm. They found what they need to be, which is give the ball to Chubb, give the ball to Hunt, let them do what they do, let Baker play action off of it, make plays, get the ball to his playmakers on the outside, Landry, Odell, and even to Hunt and Chubb uh, coming out of the backfield. So I'd have them around 12 or so, but like I said, out of the top 10, they were at nine, no longer, but pretty close. Um, and then one team that I had outside the top 10 that has made their way into the top 10, and that's the Green Bay Packers. I had them at 12 to start the year. Um, right now I have them at number two. So let's get into the top 10. Number one is obvious. It's the Chiefs, right? I had them at one. They stay at one. It's very simple for the Chiefs. They have the best coach and quarterback in the division. Um, now, I would say in the NFL, they have the best quarterback in the NFL. I think they have the second best coach in the NFL, obviously behind Bill Belichick. So for me, I think that's good enough to say combined, they have the best coach and quarterback in the NFL. It's very simple. And then the defense is coming around. It was one of the main concerns we've had about them for the last two years, especially two years ago. Last year was a concern until it wasn't a concern late in the year and then this year uh i mean they returned most of their starters so i don't know why i had any reservations about the defense i mean obviously it doesn't carry over from year to year so i guess that's a valid reason um but they're coming around they put a number on baltimore the other night and it was not close they they were more physical than the baltimore ravens which is something you never hear very few teams can say once they leave the field after playing the Ravens, that we were the more physical football team. And that's what the Chiefs were able to do on Monday night. They got the win in big, convincing fashion. I had the Chiefs at number one. The Packers, like I said, had them at 12. First thing I got to do, I'm a man. I was wrong about Aaron Rodgers. Um, 
not to say that let's let's be clear i never said he was washed right just didn't think he was doing what he was normally doing what he was capable of doing and he wasn't let's let's not also go too far the other way um he wasn't playing that well um and they were outclassed last year by the 49ers in the nfc championship game now I, I still have some reservation about them because they did beat the lions and they did beat the vikings so how much stock do you put in that it's hard to say, but you can't argue with the results. You can't argue with the record. You can't argue with the fact that their defense is playing much, much better and that they're running the football at a very good uh, clip, which opens up the pass game. We saw the touchdown to Lazard with the flow on the play action, the boot left. It was all the play action that opened that up. The corner bit down, the safety, or excuse me, the safety bit down, the corner came in. They followed the flow. They followed the run action. It allowed Lazard to get level with Lattimore on the corner route, and he hits him right in the bread basket. Um, so, again, how much stock do I put into their wins over the Lions and the Vikings? Not a whole lot, but they are 3-0. They did beat the Saints. Uh, now, again, the Saints had their issues as well, so I'll keep coming back to who are they playing, right? But I'll also say, like I said, They've been the second most impressive team thus far through three weeks, um, potentially through four weeks. We'll see how it goes next week. Packers at number two. I got the Seahawks at number three. This was one that didn't change much when we started the season. I had the Seahawks at four. Very simple here, much like the Chiefs. I think they had the second best coach and quarterback in the league. I think Pete Carroll is an excellent coach. I think Russell Wilson is the second best quarterback in football next to Patrick Mahomes. That combination will win you a bunch of football games. They're not running the ball at the clip, and we saw the Gator roll on Chris Carson. Now, he's hurt. I don't know if he's playing this week. I haven't followed up on that. Um, but they're scoring at a ridiculous rate. Russell Wilson is playing out of his mind. Their problem is obviously the defense. I would have them above the Packers if they had a better defense, but they don't. Their defense is pretty bad. It, pretty bad is being nice. So I, I trust the Packers' defense more right now. I trust Seattle, Russell Wilson. A little bit more than I do Aaron Rodgers and the Packers offense so uh, but the discrepancy between the defenses is not close and so as a result I would put the Packers at two Seahawks at three I wouldn't be upset at anyone that put the Seahawks at three or excuse me the Seahawks at two wouldn't bother me one bit uh, the Bills at number four I had the Bills to start the season at 10 wasn't so sure about Josh Allen he has taken a giant step forward okay he has taken the leap I wouldn't say quite the leap that Lamar Jackson made from year one to year two, but it's very close. Um, I mean, he's he's playing excellent football right now. Still sporadic, still sprays the ball, kind of, still will miss targets all over the field. I talked about this in the last episode when they were playing the Dolphins. They ran a bunch of crossing routes, and the Dolphins never adjusted. They played man-to-man -man defense, one single, single high safety all game, and the Bills crossed them all day long. Unders, overs, drives, shallow cross, deep cross, deep in, all of it, all game long, pick routes, the whole nine yards. And they were just playing pitch and catch. And he missed quite a few, um, but he made most of them. And so you got to give him credit. What's really impressive is the defense is outstanding early on, allowing him to progress even further. And I'll talk about this more when I talk about the Bucks. Um, but I have the Bills at four. I, it's hard. Maybe it's just because it's the Bills and it's hard to wrap your mind around the Bills being a top five team in the NFL. It's like saying if if the if the Browns were ranked, I don't know, third on this list, you would be like the Browns, really? Just it's because you know their history. Right. And it's so hard to wrap your mind around the history that you forget history doesn't have anything to do with today's power rank. So I have the Bills at four. Much improved. Like I said, I had them at 10 to start with. They moved up six spots to number four. Another team that I was very wrong about, the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, came into the season. I had them ranked at 17. Defensively, they clearly the best defensive football. Um, one of the keys that I had for them going into the season, you can check the power rankings, is if their defense can re replicate what they did last year, which I just didn't think was possible because they were so great. Um, then, yeah, of course, they'd be a top 10 team. Um, the issue is, I, I don't know how to feel about Big Ben. 
Um, he's coming around, but – and really, maybe it's not Big Ben. It, they don't really have the game breakers, the playmakers, right? They got a bunch of good receivers. They got a decent running back stable, decent tight end, and obviously a great defense. But there are no game breakers, right? Tyreek Hill for the Chiefs can just blow the game open. Um, you can look at other guys across the league that can blow the game open. The Steelers don't have that guy. The Steelers have a a really good wide receiver core, a good quarterback, and an excellent defense and an excellent football coach. And so they're going to be a good team. But I wonder, could they really keep up with the Chiefs, um, even as good as their defense is? Are they actually going to be able to stop the Chiefs? And if not, are they going to be able to score enough points offensively? Even if they can bring the Chiefs down a little bit, can they score enough? So the Chiefs, say they average scoring, I don't know what they actually average, but I know it's north of 30. So if they if they get to 30, 35 points, can the Steelers get 36? I just don't know that they can. Uh, I, I'm not too confident in that. But as of right now, they're 3-0. Their defense is the best in football. And with the no offseason and things like that, um, it's hard to not put them at number five. Now, number six, another team that I think I was right on, although for different reasons heading into the season, they have the Titans at number six. Titans have one very simple issue. They cannot cover anybody. Offensively, they are fine. Even without A.J. Brown, they are 3-0. and Tiny Hills moving the ball up and down the field, throwing it. Looked a little questionable last week against the Vikings, made some decisions that just did not sit well with me. Uh, but overall, he's been a godsend. They've been able to score points um, and and cover up for a lot of mistakes on defense. They're well coached, and as a result, they're able to win close games. Um, but the reality is, because of this defense, there's no way they should be three and zero. They gave up thirty points to the Jaguars. They gave up thirty to the Vikings, I believe. They gave up 30 points in week one, if I'm not mistaken. They can't cover. They give up too many chunk plays. Um, I think on a given play-to-play basis, they're actually not that bad. Um, run defense is okay. Pass defense on, you know, again, play-to-play is okay, average at best. But then they give up, you know, over 100 yards to a rookie receiver who just goes off on them, m- making plays down the field. And they did that last year. Think about the playoff game. When they were still in it, the Chiefs had the ball. And what happened? They give up a deep touchdown, I think, to Sammy Watkins. It might have been it might have been Tyreek Hill, but one or the other. You can't do that. You just simply can't. Um, and then another thing that really concerns me is let me let me rephrase. The level of concern is growing for Derrick Henry. Um, I'm not like worried just yet, but I have an eyebrow raise for sure. It's something that I've never liked about him and it seems to be bearing out now, but he's just not nimble enough in the backfield. Now, does he need to be for what they do? No, not really. Uh, but the fact remains that he's just not that nimble. He's not that elusive in the backfield. And so if he doesn't get a clean head start, a clean, a clean run out of the backfield to hit that line of scrimmage, Probably not going far. Now, what's great about him is he still falls forward for three or four yards, which he'll take. uh, But that's not going to win you games. What we need to win games is what we saw last year, week 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, and into the playoffs. That's not realistic, especially not early on. Um, It's just not. I think as the season progresses, you will see him progress much like you do in the game. Early on, he may not be doing okay, but as the game gets longer, progresses, heads towards the fourth quarter. He starts to get more and more yards. The defense starts to lag a little bit more behind. They start to not want to hit that big dude. And he starts to put up numbers. So I'm not obviously I'm not out on Derrick Henry or the Titans run game just yet. But again, I have an eyebrow raised uh to what I'm seeing. Uh so Titans at six. That's where I had them to start the season. Didn't move them. They didn't move the needle for me. Um like I said they're mostly at six because they're three and zero, and it's just hard to ignore that a team's three and zero at this point, um, even if you don't think they're that good. Um, so Titans at six, number seven, 
the Baltimore Ravens. Yes, finally, you hear the Baltimore Ravens name. I couldn't help but drop him out of the top five after Monday night. You can say what you want about how good you think they are, but that's one of those games you just can't unsee it. Uh, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And we saw it. It was not good. Um, and it was the reason I was comfortable moving them down is because it was more of the same that we saw in all the other big games. I don't know the exact record. I think it's 21 and two um, against teams not in the playoffs and not Patrick Mahomes led. Um, and then 0 and five against Patrick Mahomes and in the playoffs. It's hard to ignore that. And so Monday was ugly. Um, and while ultimately I still think the Ravens are top three in the AFC, uh, right now I just can't put them there, especially after what we saw Monday night. And then, like I said earlier, Lamar Jackson still has issues, especially when they're behind. And I think the biggest issue that he has is he is simply pressing and doing too, too much. It's the same thing I've been saying about Carson Wentz. You can see it in their action, their body language. Um, they're pressing. They're trying to force stuff to happen, and it's just not happening. Number eight, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who I had at five to start the year. I wouldn't be opposed to putting them higher. Um, this this was a lot more about record than it was what my eyes tell me. Um, I think they're better than eight. I think they are probably about the fifth best fifth best team in the NFL. Three weeks in, they're two and one. Obviously, they had the ugly opening night loss to the Saints. Um, and then two, two convincing wins over the Panthers and the – who else did they play? I can't even remember. Um, but it, here's the thing. What's key for the Bucks? they need to maintain their position within the ranks in the NFC. And so what they need is to win games early as Tom Brady and his weapons and the offense builds chemistry, builds timing, builds rhythm – um, and things like that. The defense is actually really good. I think top three, top five at the worst. Um, it's hard to really, defense are hard to really pick out. I think Pittsburgh obviously has the best defense. I wouldn't be opposed to anyone that says the Bucks have the second best. Um, they just need to win games early as the season progresses, as the chemistry builds, as the rhythm builds. Um, I think you'll start to see the true, um, the true colors, if you will, of the Bucks come out and what they really are going to be. I have the Bucks at number eight. Number nine, the Rams. The Rams, I swung and missed on really badly. I had them at 20 to start the year. Um, here's the thing. Sean McVay has rediscovered his touch of creativity and play calling. I think, again, I've said this. I've made this point a few different times. The deep coordinator that he hired, I think, has made him more comfortable as a head coach. I think, in turn, that has made Jared Goff more, more comfortable as a quarterback. And I think overall, the play calling and the comfortability level that they both have is showing. And you can see that they're doing what Jared Goff does best, uh, which is get around, get active, get moving, get on the move and throw the ball that way, especially off the play action, which now that they can run the ball, Malcolm Brown, Henderson, Akers, when he comes back, uh, I think they'll be fine. Aaron Donald defensively, there's not very many people in the NFL especially not today, that just jump off the TV screen like he does. Every other play, he's in the backfield. He's getting close to, if not hitting the quarterback. He's stopping guys in the backfield, taking on double teams, splitting them. He's unreal. Um, their biggest issue defensively is in coverage. Jalen Ramsey got paid, and, you know, I mean, he's doing all right. Gave up uh, a touchdown last week. You know, their back end is, is not great. And if they don't address it, unfortunately, in NFC, that's where a lot of teams are the best. Take a look at the Packers, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, when he's back and healthy. Now you got Lazard and Scantling coming along. That's a lot to deal with. If the Saints figure it out and get into the playoffs, that's a lot to deal with on the back end. The Bucks, Godwin, Evans, Grant, Howard, Scotty Miller, that's a lot to deal with on the back end. So... The Rams, again, I have them at nine. Definitely better than I thought they were going into the year, but I, I'm i not totally sold just yet uh, on them being like some playoff or a Super Bowl contender. And then finally, at number 10, the New England Patriots. 
had him at 15 going into the year. Now, they had him at 15. This was long before they even thought about signing Cam Newton. Um, Cam Newton came into the league or came into the Patriots organization right before the season started. I had put this power rankings out maybe a month or so before that. Um, so I probably would have put him a touch higher, maybe like 12 or so um, once the season or once I knew Cam Newton was going there. But I had him at 15, and it's very simple. Uh, much like the Chiefs, they have the best coach and quarterback in the division. I like Josh Allen, what he's doing, what his improvement is. Even if you wanted to say that between him and Cam Newton, it's a wash, okay, fine. But there is no better coach than Bill Belichick, and that's what the Patriots have. So I have the Patriots at 10. Um, there's not much else. Again, they kind of remind me of the Steelers. I think they're a little more balanced offensively and defensively than the Steelers are. I think Steelers are obviously very defensive heavy. Don't think they're that great on offense. I think there's a little more balance with the Patriots. But my question remains the same for both teams. It's where are the playmakers? Like you have Cam Newton, you got Big Ben, and you got a couple of receivers on both sides that are pretty good, a couple of running backs on both sides that are pretty good. But no one that's like going to break the game open for you. Both teams are relying on their defense and the ability to methodically move up and down the field and score points when they need it. They don't have any playmakers. And so I think that's going to be the ultimate hindrance for both teams. Um, but Patriots at 10 up from 15 to start the year. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your top 10 NFL power rankings as of right now. Like I said, the full list will be out next week. Right now, what I want to do is talk about tonight's Thursday Night Football showdown. All right, so tonight, Thursday night football, Broncos, Jet. It's going to be a real, real snooze fest. It's probably going to be very ugly because neither team is very good. But it's still an opportunity for you to make some money. And DraftKings Showdown tonight, we're going to talk about your must plays, your must avoids, your value picks, and all that good stuff. Let's start with the must plays. Number one, no offense, $13,500 captain's pick. Um... And then I'll also throw in Jameson Crowder, 12.3 thousand captain's pick. For both, it's very simple. Uh, for Broncos secondary, uh, their secondary has surrendered the most opponents passing yards per game in the AFC this year, almost 280 yards per game. And the Jets are obviously decimated by wide receiver. Um, but just across the board, they're decimated at, with injuries. Crowder's coming back. He's going to get a lot of volume. He was already getting a lot of volume with Darnold. Um, and now the fact that a lot of their guys are out, it's only going to increase that number. Is it going to be good? Probably not. Um, Broncos defense is not great, but it's not bad. And considering the Jets are so bad, it's like they're going against a great defense. So it's probably not going to be great for Crowder. I would lean more towards Noah Fant as the captain's pick, as I think that's a more sure and safe bet than Darnold throwing to Crowder against this secondary in this defense. Um, Noah Fant is, I mean, he's going up against the Jets. Uh, they just aren't good. Uh, and Ripien is an undrafted free agent. Leaves a little concern there. He's thrown a total of nine passes in his NFL career. So you're not leaning on a lot here. Um, what you're really looking for is the volume just because of Noah Fant being probably their best receiver, you know, slash tight end. Normally having an undrafted free agent with that few passes normally spells bad news, but the Jets have the 31st ranked pass defense. I'm actually interested to know who's 31st or 32nd, probably the Titans actually. Um, the safety blanket for most quarterbacks is their tight end or a slot receiver. Um, in this case, Noah Fant, really, really good tight end. And with with Sutton out, there's not a receiver that they have that I truly trust. I like Jerry Judy, but he's kind of been a disappointment so far. Maybe that's the quarterback situation. Um, Tim Patrick, KJ Hamler. KJ Hamler was a dud last week. We'll talk about him in a second. But Noah Fent leads the team in catches, leads the team in catch or receiving yards, receiving touchdowns, and has 23% of the red zone targets. So to me, it's a it's an obvious choice with Noah Fent. Um, that's what I would go with. Like I said, if you want to take a flyer on Crowder, it's a little bit cheaper and it's going to get the volume of targets for Darnold and the Jets. I wouldn't be opposed to that as well. Now, a few guys that I would avoid. Number one on the list, 
um, both quarterbacks, Sam Darnold and Rivian. Listen, I don't think Sam Darnold is a complete bust. It's hard to say anyway. I think a lot of it has to do with his coach, Adam Gates, who just, quite frankly, isn't very good at his job. I've never seen someone live so long after the success that they've had with another Hall of Fame all-time great in Peyton Manning, but he's living off of it. He's living good. Um, I He's not going to be there much longer, so it is what it is. But, uh, you know, I, to this point, whether you want to blame Darnold, blame the coach, blame whatever else, to me, I was not a fan of Darnold coming in to his career, but so far it is not looking good. Maybe he'll get another chance elsewhere if the Jets actually do end up getting the first pick overall. They take Trevor Lawrence. Maybe they ship Darnold off somewhere else and we could see him flourish somewhere else. But as of right now, no, sir. Um, now, again, I, I said this, but I'd also avoid Ripien. Sure, he may be able to lead the Broncos to a win tonight, which I think he will. Um, and he will probably be able to get the ball more effectively to Noah Fant and Jerry Judy um, and, and a few other guys. But he's, it's not like he's going to have some party where he's going to throw four or five touchdowns and for 350 yards or something like that. Like, that's just not in the cards. Um, now, maybe you stack him with Fant as your captain um, and, and take a flyer on it that way. But otherwise, uh, no, no chance. And then another guy, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say he's a complete must avoid. Just someone, someone I would cautious you on, or caution you on, is uh, Melvin Gordon. Not a huge Melvin Gordon fan tonight either. The Jets are bad, but their run defense isn't terrible. Uh, it's certainly not great, but it's not terrible. And they're probably going to run the ball quite a bit, given their quarterback situation in Denver. Uh, so, what I don't want to end up happening is saying this. And then Melvin Gordon gets, you know, 20 plus touches because they just want to get the game over with and keep the ball out of a bad quarterback's hand, especially with Philip Lindsay likely not playing, likely inactive. Um, but again, my concern is he hasn't been productive so far in the year. I think he had one touchdown. And, uh, you know, I don't see what the big deal was about him last year. Certainly don't see what the big deal about him is this year. You can make the case that for tonight he would be a good play for volume. I just I'm not I don't see it. Not with the way the Jets run defense is, coupled with the fact that I don't think Melvin Gordon is that good. Uh I think Gordon is the must avoid here. And then a few sleeper picks, not a whole lot here, but two guys, Tim Patrick and KJ Hamler. Listen, it ain't great. The game tonight ain't great, so take it for what it is. Uh, but the Jets secondary is just not good, especially outside the numbers. KJ Hamler's speed, Patrick's size should be able to get open on these guys. Um, and considering you can get them both uh, for under 10000 in DraftKings, I think it's worth a shot. Um, Hamler was a dud last week, as I said earlier, but I just don't foresee that happening for a second time. Uh, and so that is your DraftKings showdown. Info for tonight, your picks. Um, I... I will take the Broncos to win tonight. Uh, it's, you know, in all honesty, I wouldn't touch this game with a 10-foot pole, but for the sake of making my picks, I would absolutely take the Broncos because they're both bad. The Broncos are just far less bad than the Jets. So with all that said, it's been the Simple Sport Podcast. I'll see you guys on Saturday. We will be talking about Sunday's games, giving up some more DraftKings tips. Until then, I will see you guys. Peace.